for Gene Shepard, author, raconteur, and commentator of the contemporary scene. Here's Gene. That's your problem. Yes, sir. Once in a while, you know, a letter comes in, and the guy really uh, starts a thing going in your head. And uh, he says, uh, this is a letter. Dear Shep, I was recently monkeying around in my basement, and a startling thought came to me. Do you realize that a great part of our heritage is slowly disappearing? That is right. The basement is becoming obsolete. With the onslaught of new apartments and prefabricated houses, basements have been ignored. What a knife in the back of culture. I can remember, as you probably can, a time in my childhood when I spent 95% of my time in a cellar. Many things I remember doing in a basement would cause my parents to disown me if they knew about them. Imagine, and this is a great, this is a great concept, and it's quite true. Imagine in the year 3000, a guide in a museum taking a tour through an exhibit called The Basement, consisting of old, bald, useless tires, piles of rags, scores of unfinished projects that have become part of the house. The classic basement. And he says, please do something to preserve this bit of Americana which is slowly slipping out of our heritage. That is correct. I must say, you know, I bet a lot of guys, kids listening to me right now, don't know what it's like to hide in the basement under the stairs. Well, you know, first of all, you, if, if you're going to talk about the basement, you're going to have to discuss the, 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 the tactile quality of a basement. Begin with basements smell like basements. They smell like no other part of the house. And once you've smelled the basement, you know what basements smell like. They smell like basements and nothing else. And so the basement is a highly erotic place. Yes, it is. No, it's got all... It, it, it absolutely is very erotic. In fact, it is the sexiest room in the house. And uh, no wonder a whole generation is growing up who have to learn about sex by buying textbooks with pictures in 17 volumes from the supermarket. <laughs> but uh, nevertheless, the basement is an, is an erotic room, highly erotic, for, for many reasons. To begin with, it is really sort of uh, the, it's sort of the uh, no man's land of the house, that nobody owns the basement. Everybody has a, you know, if in a house, everybody's got his own bedroom, the dining room is where you eat, the, you know, the, the living room is where you all squat and sit around and watch television and argue with your old man. The kitchen is where you, you know, have the kitchen stuff. But the basement is something else again, and it's down under the soil. It's down under the earth. It's, 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 well, the, the basement is very closely akin to one of man's most truly basic Housing concepts. The cave. The basement is like the cave. And uh, we all have the cave digging uh, urge. There is nobody out there who ever once was a kid who at not one point in his life has felt the urge to burrow into the earth and create a cave. Now, I... I, I'm sure that girls must have done it. I was not, uh, I never saw girls in my neighborhood create caves. Never. They might have had the urge to do it and they might have done it, but I never saw it. Did you, George? That was mostly a male thing. 
was digging a hole in the side of the ground somewhere, in the side of a hill someplace, and digging it down deep, and then putting pieces of tin over the top, and then covering that with, with dirt, and then crawling in afterwards, and squatting down there and eating crackers. <laughs> Well, I mean that's that's the whole you know the whole point of being in a cave, and and a and a cave is a very basic thing. See, I think that we cannot get rid of our racial memories. I'm talking about the memories of the entire species of man. You know, they talk about no, nah, you know, they, they, they. I wonder when when some scientist, you know, like a uh, hundred years from now, when they really start to study man, and they discover that many of our instincts. And our memories go much further back than anyone suspects today. But uh, nevertheless, that there is a theory that that one of the first things that man did when he crawled out of the of the mud, of the antediluvian soil, out of the out of that ancient lake, he crawled up upon the shore. So he crawled around, and the the first and the best place that he found at that time was a natural habitat, the cave. Well, now, the, the good groovy thing about the cave was the sun didn't hit him the top of the head no more. And also, that thing with those big teeth had trouble getting his head into, into the cave door there, see? The cave door was only 12 feet across. And this thing that was after him had a head about 15 feet wide, you know, and just couldn't get his knob through there, see? But he could stick his tongue in there and look real bad. And then, at that point, uh, several other types of creatures began to appear. See, they heard that there was this easy pickings. You know, with this thing that laid around there and, and read the Sunday papers and, and it had very short claws and not much in the way of teeth and very tender skin. See, almost every other type of creature is, has very tough skin. And uh, you yourself, if you were looking for something to eat, you surely wouldn't pick a, uh, an alligator or a, or a hooded cobra uh, or even a goat. You know, goats got tough skin and all those hoofs and horns and stuff. Who would you look for? Yeah, you know, your Uncle Fred. Uh, you know, he, he, he looks good on a spit, you know, suspended over a fire. You don't even have to skin him, you know, because the skin is kind of nice. You know, well, a little butter and salt and pepper on there. It's not bad, you know. So we were prime prey that first moment, that first instant when man is laying in a the cave there. And suddenly something comes tearing. Oh, I'm tearing into the cave there real big. Thing. <laughs> and he's yelling and he's got teeth. That was the first saber-toothed tiger that showed up. And forget it, Ock and Charlie was gone. Just like that. But they noticed one thing. On certain days, the saber-toothed tiger did not show up. Just didn't come around. Well, now it took many centuries for Og and Charlie to put that together because their mind worked very slowly. In fact, their mind hardly ever worked at all, if at all. Now, the point that I'm attempting to make here in this lecture tonight is the point that, that on those nights when, when, uh, when the saber-toothed tiger did not visit Og and Charlie's cave and make of Og's haunch a tenderloin, uh, the, the two began to put together that when he didn't show up, there was always this funny sound outside. Now, what was that funny sound, friends? It was not the sound of the A train going uptown. It was the sound of rain. This is the truth. That animals bed down in rain. Did you know that? That very few animals move when it's raining. That, uh, that you'll find uh, the deer, you'll find especially the cats, the big cats. Uh, cats don't like water, not right, right for starters. And so when the rain came down, that was the first night they had a week that the big cougar didn't come to make a meal of your Aunt Emily, you know. So man began to identify uh, his, this feeling of, of, uh, of uh, yeah, security, safety, warmth, and all the rest of it with the sound of rain pouring down on the roof. So it is today. Now, the cave was always also the refuge from, from the vicissitudes of life. I mean, you come, you know, you come barreling over the top of a hill with four or five rhinoceroses after you. If that cave looks good, you know, <laughs> it really does. Uh, ordinarily, it's a hole in the ground, but man, when those things with the horns sticking out of the ears come after you, bellowing and yelling, and you you just make it to the cave, there ain't nothing more beautiful, right? 
So the cave was really, uh, you know, it was, it was safety. It was everything else. And so, so it is with the basement. I must, you know, since we're going to bring this up, a, a basement has other ramifications. To begin with, since the basement is, there's a certain, uh, a certain wildness to the basement. The basement is not finished off like the rest of the house. In almost every case, the basement is just, you know, these black, those heavy concrete blocks all around, and there's concrete floor. And you look up from, you know, you, you, you appear up, and there's just a couple of little yellow naked light bulbs hanging down there, see? And the, the, the seating of the basement is actually the bottom of the floor. You know, and it's a lot of pieces of wood, and it's dark, and there's cocoons and stuff in it, you know. And uh, and there's dark corners in the basement, everywhere you look. And at the far end of the basement, it's really dark down there. And the, the mysterious quality of the basement adds to the, uh, it adds to the religious intensity of the, of the kids living above the basement for one very good reason. The basement at night, below your feet, always seem to be mysterious and filled with danger. Right under your feet was something dangerous. And you'd hear an occasional mysterious noise down there. I can remember the old man were sitting at the table, you know, eating in the kitchen. And all of a sudden, down in the basement, for no reason, I hear a clunk. I was like, shh, wait. There's something in the basement. Shh. Now be careful. Now be quiet. Shh, shh. Listen, did you hear anything? Dead silence from the basement. That underneath you, there was always this cavern. It was like a cave under you. Dark, mysterious. Even smell different from the rest of the house. Had a different quality. One of the great traumas of my life occurred in the basement. It occurred in the winter time. A dark, dark, cold winter night. Now, all of the time I had lived in houses as a kid, we always had basements under us. And these basements were always, there was always this thing, about every couple of weeks, shh, shh, there's something in the basement. And there never was. Well, one night, my mother was off on something. She was at the movies with Mrs. Bruner or something. My father was out of town. He was gone. My kid brother was at scout meeting. I was down at Schwartz's place. It was one of those strange kind of intersection of forces. And our house was set up on a, on a, well, it was raised up over the ground, actually, around there. It had a, had a lawn that had a terrace down, you know, kind of drifted down to the sidewalk. It was a one-story plan house, wooden frame bungalow, but it had a big basement in it. The basement was the entire size, well, the size of the whole house, not just a little hole in the ground. This was a real full basement, and it had a coal bin down in there. And uh, also there was a great big pile of tires at the other end where the old man piled up all the 616 tires, you know, and had all kinds of cans of paint and jazz. And there was a couple of old tables that my mother had stuck down there and old, uh, you know, old folding chairs and all kinds of stuff hanging from the sides, the walls. The old man had inner tubes hanging there and tire tools. And, and uh, he had a workbench down there piled high with, with ball jars full of nails and cigar boxes full of clamps and grommets and all that jazz. See? But it was all done. The basement was just practically filled up with stuff. And in the middle of it all was the furnace. So on this night, it was about 9 o'clock at night, maybe a little later, about 10 o'clock, I come walking up the street, and the house is dark. See, it's absolutely pitch black dark. Well, it was just a whole series of coincidences. Down the street from the other side, I see my kid brother coming, and we meet right in front of the house. Well, just at that point, uh, down, down the side street and turning left comes Mrs. Bruner's car. She stops the car and lets my mother out. The, all three of us have now met together on the street, just by a coincidence, before we were about to go in the house. I was just going to go in, see? So I said, hi, Ma. She's saying, yeah, how are you? And uh, my kid brother says, hi, you know. And so 
we got, all three of us walked around the house, up the driveway, and the house was dark, you know. We walk up the back porch, and, and my mother got, has got the key. She opens the key of the house, and we walk in. That's nice and warm in the house. It's been colder than hell out. I mean, really cold out. This is a real Midwestern winter, and it's kind of still. Very little wind this night, but there were big, these, these huge icicles that hang down from the roof. And so, into the kitchen we go. It's real warm. So Randy slams the door, and uh, my mother just flips the lock on the thing, turns the light on. And uh, the first thing that happened, of course, my kid brother dives into the icebox. He brings out his peanut butter and jelly, you know, and all that stuff. So, it, you know, we're just doing normal things. See, my mother goes into the into her bedroom, takes her coat off, walking around like that. And so she comes back out into the kitchen. I am now sitting at the kitchen table with a salami sandwich. My mother uh, walks over to the refrigerator and she takes out this this can of milk or this bottle of milk. You know, she's checking the stuff and she brings something out and sits down. And just as she does that, we're just sitting there, you know, casually talking. When all of a sudden, down in the basement, is the same sound, no different, no more uh, sharp or delineated or dramatic than any other time. We had heard the same sounds all of our life. It, you hear it clunk down there. At that, my brother goes, shh, shh, there's something in the basement. I said, shh, be quiet, Randy. I heard it too. We sat there for a couple of minutes. Well, this is all what we always did. Well, now, generally, at that time, had the old man been home, the old man would say, wait a minute, just a minute. I, 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 now, I'm going to not check. He would have gone down and checked. But the old man is not there, see? So, you know, five minutes go by, and then nothing happened, and uh, that's it. See, we're sitting there again, and I'm, I'm making another salami sandwich, and the, my kid brother is talking away there, when suddenly, again... Clunk down in the basement. This time it is a real clunk. And I thought I recognized what the sound was. Yeah, we had we had we had a couple of shovels up against the wall in the in the back of the basement. It would be the front of the house. The back from where we were. See, we were sitting in the kitchen. The front of the house was way at the other side, but that was the dark part of the basement. It would be the front of the house, see? Well, I thought I recognized it. It sounded like one of the shovels had just slid sideways and bumped into something. You know, there was a slight hump like that. I said, shh, there's something in the basement. There really is something in the basement. We sat there for about five minutes, absolutely stunned, because it, it was unmistakable there was something in the basement. I said, there's something in the basement. Well, my old man was gone. My kid brother was younger than I was. My mother is my mother. So I said, I'm going to go check. So I walk over to the door leading to the basement. And I take the doorknob and I start to open it. I just, it made a rattling sound just like a doorknob makes. And just as I did that, I hear down again in the basement, Pow! something broke. A glass jar broke in the basement. And I want to tell you, now it ain't no way to kid yourself there is something in the basement. But still, I didn't believe it, because all of my life, we had thought there was something in the basement. And it never turned out to be anything in the basement. So my mother says, be careful. Be careful. Close the door. My kid brother's sitting there, you know. <laughs> His eyes are as big as, you know, big as marbles. He's looking around. I said, there's something in the basement. I said, I'm going to go get my shotgun. Well, I had a, a shotgun. Now, I was, at the time, about 17, 16, and I had a 410-gauge shotgun, an over and under. Now, if you don't know much about shotguns, an over and under is a double-barrel shotgun in which one barrel is above the other instead of parallel side by side. It was an over and under Remington 
410 gauge shotgun with fine bird shot in it. So I, 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 I said, wait a minute, I'm going get, to get the gun. And my mother says, be careful, be careful. And so with that, I go through the living room and into my bedroom, into my closet, and there leaning up against the, the corner of the closet was, the, was my gun case. By the way, this was, was the greatest possession of my life, the shotgun. Uh, I never went hunting much with it. But we used to go out and, and we, would, we would do target practice with the shotgun. You know, we would, in fact, at one time I was kind of into skeet. And uh, we would, we, we, one of the guys had one of these, uh, one of these target uh, slings. We'd shoot these, these clay targets. It was a great sport. So, you know, and I had this 410. So I, I, I zip it out of the bag and I slip two shells into it. And I walk back through the living room and through the dining room and it was dark. And by God, I hear another sound down there. There is something down there. What do you do? So I go to the door. I hold on to the knob. Now, I would never do it today, but I did it then. I open the door. Now, you do a lot of dumb things in your life, and this was one of the dumber ones. The light was lit upstairs, but there was, you know, no light going down these steps. But there was a light in the coal bin. But you had to go halfway down the steps to turn the basement light on. So I said to my mother, Mom! Say, Mom! You better call the police or something. So she says, Okay. I start down the steps. At that point that I hit the landing, just as I hit the landing, and I was scared, man, I hear another clunk, clunk, clunk. Something bumped three times, just clunk, 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 like that. It was somebody knocking over a wooden box or something, knocking over a wooden box. Well, and the only thing I could think to do was to stick my head down under the the, the, the wall, see, I was down on the landing, now, and I stick my head down, and I said, All right, who's ever down there? You get out of here, you hear? You get out of here. No sound. No sound. Come on, get out of there. And I hear my mother up on the, up on the, the next floor, I hear her talking on the phone. And then everything happened so damn fast. I, I reached up, went down more, two more steps, reached up, and flicked the light on. Well, at that, I see, I, I'm now down on the basement floor, and I'm right there, right next to the steps, when I see these two dark shapes coming at me. <laughs> oh, my God. And they just moved right out of the back of, the, of, of this darkness, just moved at me, and, and coming real fast. I says, you guys, stop it! Stop it! You stop it! And without any warning... Something went off. It went pow, and it wasn't what I had. <laughs> I just heard a lot of lot of lot of noise down there, and I just took the gun and I went kaboom, kaboom, like that into the darkness. And it was a dead silence for a second. The lights were out. How the lights went on, I have no idea. The lights were gone, and I turned and I ran like hell back up the steps. I mean, I ran, falling and screaming, <laughs> and, and, and you know, boom, I could just hear that sound, that, that, that gun echoing. And just as I get to the top of the steps, I figured nothing's happened. I didn't, see, I figured it's all imagination. At that point, I still didn't believe it. I still didn't believe it. And just at that point, as I get to the top of the steps, I hear, crash. <laughs> Something crashed in the basement. And I knew what it was right away. It was the basement windows. Something was going out the basement window. And I stood at the top of the steps with that smoking 410. And out of the, out of the, the, the doorway leading to the basement came this great drifting cloud of powder smoke. Have you ever been in a room where guns have been fired? That's a special feeling. It's not like being outside when guns are fired. This is something they never show on television. 
a curious drifting smoke, and the smell, and a ringing sound. It's like the world was still echoing all around me. You fire two 410s, two 410 shells off in a basement, surrounded by concrete walls, you got a sound. And whatever it was that went off before that, I don't know. To this day, I don't know. Well, just about that, that instant, you could hear the sound of sirens coming. And I stood up in the kitchen. My mother came running out. She said, what happened? What happened? What happened? I heard you shooting. What happened? My kid brother's under the daybed, whimpering. Man, he was digging in. And I heard this banging on the front steps. My mother goes to open the door. In came two great big blue cops. I mean, they, they looked huge. They were wearing their winter uniforms. It was cold, the wind. And the guy says, what's, what's going on here? My mother says, there's something in the basement. And the cop walked to the doorway. And he says, he says, my God, you've been shooting. Has somebody been shooting here? I said, yeah. I shot the 410 down in the basement. He said, you did what? I says, I shot the 410 in the basement. Hey, Pete, bring the light, quick! And they had this big flashlight. And these two guys went down the steps with drawn police specials. And I stayed upstairs. And then one of them hollered, Hey, kid, come on down here! And I went down in the basement. And at the end of the basement was this, was this tremendous rubble where somebody had gone through the back window, broken the window. And on the floor was a long, thin trail of bright red blood going right out the window. And one of the cops rushed up the steps. He says, get out of the way, kid. He runs up the steps and I can hear him on the outside. He's checking out there with the big light. And they never discovered him, whatever it was. Nobody ever found out what it was. And for two days, cops were at the house asking questions. They never forgot it. The feel of that 410 going off in the basement. The roar of whatever it was that went off just before that. They never found out what it was. Although, one of the cops said something had been fired in the room. He said, that ain't shotgun smell. I'm smelling it. <laughs> Every time I see Adam at 12, I get nervous. Every time I hear a clunk down in the basement, I get worried. And so any of you kids who grew up without a basement below you have grown up totally unaware of the true nature of dark, shifting evil. The great cave of despair. I remember the second day I said to this, this cop, I said, You don't think I killed him, do you? He says, no. Nah. So I never heard of nobody getting killed like that with a 410. But he ain't going to come around here soon. He says, you taught him a lesson. I said, but I didn't kill him, did I? He says, no. He says, no. He says, he'll be picking birdshot out of him for about a month with a pair of tweezers. And he'd be walking sideways. Kid, don't go around shooting like that anymore. That could be awful dangerous. Yeah, I know. And I never fired a gun in anger again. Ever.
listening to Gene Shepard, author, raconteur, and commentator on the contemporary scene.